So I think my task is to open it up for questions. And I think probably best to open it up for questions from the audience at this point, because we've talked enough. So, <laughs> yes. Um, are you a successful prosecutor? Are you a successful? Are you a successful prosecutor? So I think if you ask my parents, they'd say I'm a successful everything. No. Uh, <laughs> if yes, would you consider being a public defender? Hmm. That's, that's a really interesting question. Um, you know, the career I had as a prosecutor was one that made a whole lot of sense to me uh, at the time. And people pick, you know, where, where they'd like to focus their energies. I'll, I'll say that for me, being a prosecutor was, was really important. I feel very strongly about the need to make sure there, there is law and order. Notwithstanding that, uh, in, in my most recent job where I had to assist policymakers in figuring out smart policies, it's certainly clear to me that criminal justice reform is really an important place for, for a lot of smart people to be spending their time. And one of the things that was uh, interesting to me in the sort of disparate characters um, and, and, and players that came together to advocate for reform. You know, at one point in time, I was part of the team that prosecuted the former New York City police commissioner. He went to jail for uh, a good number of years for some serious crimes. And on the other side of that sentence, he came out and became a, a, a really passionate advocate for criminal justice reform, which is something uh, I very much applaud. Mm -hmm. Other questions from the audience? The um, sentences w that were commuted, but where the um, the person who was incarcerated still has five years to serve or six years to serve and so forth, are those um, can those commutations now be re reversed? No, no, no. They're, they're, those are final. They'll they'll they as a matter of right will get out as soon as uh, President Obama's order is effective and cannot be overruled. I guess. Um, so with our, under, with our understanding and the evolution of trauma and PTSD and how it relates to people who have experienced um, our, our criminal justice system, how does that new understanding fit with all of the programs that are seeking to basically lessen sentences for nonviolent, not, all of these, all of the non-offenders if, if our understanding of addiction and our understanding of trauma has this comorbidity with violence, how can you, doesn't, doesn't, the, doesn't the distinction of criminals into like good criminals, being nonviolent criminals and violent criminals or bad criminals or like unrehabilitable criminals, doesn't that just make the problem worse? Why don't you go ahead, Ernie, if you want to. Okay. Um, the, uh, there's a very important consideration in violent crimes that isn't there in nonviolent crimes, and that is the victims. And uh, you know, part of the concept of, of, of a punitive criminal justice system is to um, uh, in a way apologize for the failure of the social contract to protect them from what the state is supposed to do. You, you sacrifice a lot of freedoms in order to live in a state that will protect you from uh, terrible things happening to your family and you uh, by people who are bigger and tougher than you are. It's a pretty fundamental thing. And one of the things that's emerged in the last 20 years really is restorative justice models that are very effective uh, in because the in many many cases where the vic the vic the families of victims of violent crimes do not want to see them punished, they want to see some reconciliation that enables their family member who has been so traumatized and injured by this to be healed in a way that they can go forward. And the trick to that is offering the perpetrator something other than punishment uh, in exchange for his doing what only he can do for the victim which is uh, not just apologize, but um, uh, ex explain where he was coming from, and, but rec you know, recognizing with remorse what he did. This is especially true with guns all over the place, and 16 and 17-year-olds 
you know, who get in a fight and shoot someone. The worst thing that ever happened was they're doing that, and it was totally mindless. And uh, those are exactly the kind of cases that work very well in restorative justice. A program called Common Justice for the Vera Institute in New York, a, a woman named Danielle Serrett, brilliant, brilliant woman who's been working on violent juvenile offenders, the, the worst case scenario for everyone, and gets tremendous benefits. Over 85% of the victims and their families claim to have much greater satisfaction with the outcome that prevented incarceration is the alternative to incarceration or ended incarceration for that person uh, and allowed that person to assure the victims, because the biggest fear of victims is that they're going to continue to be victims, that the person's going to come out and hurt them again. And there's nothing uh, as good as the, 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 the seeing the person who was the perpetrator turn into a human being before, in, before your eyes and assure you that, that then they're not going to be doing any harm to you. Can I just interject for one second, Phil, because the other thing I think is important to recognize is, you know, when we talk about victims or people who commit offenses, they're really the same people. That is the same population of people. And, the, you know, one day someone may be, and I think the, the film made that very clear, you know, this is a highly victimized and traumatized community of people. Um, and they're really, the, the, they're one and the same people. And when you hear, you know, kind of victims' rights or victim advocacy, there's a very, there's a stereotype image of who that victim is, you know often a blonde woman <laughs> um, or a child. And what we, what we neglect to focus on is how many of the victims are the very same communities that we see cycle in and out of jail and out of prisons as well. And so, you know, so I think your question is a really important one to focus on. If we just make treatment programs and we treat underlying problems only to that most sympathetic group of people, we're not tackling the, the underlying problem. And so I think in addition to thinking about things like restorative justice, there needs to be a new attention to the fact this is a really victimized and traumatized community. And people just glide over that in the way that Glenn suggests with these like labels that's just, well, you're, you're the criminal or you're the offender as opposed to you are a person who committed this offense today and yesterday you were the victim of X or you know two years before that you had to experience Y. And so getting people to understand they're much more complicated life stories behind these things, I think is, it's a hurdle. I think it's a hurdle to do it, but I think it's important to focus on the fact that we should, no one should be excluded from the idea of rehabilitation or thinking about how you could improve life outcomes for people just by giving them a brand. I don't know if anyone else wants. I, I'd love to touch on that as well, right? So I think your, your question is so powerful because oftentimes within, as a clinician, within the clinical framework, right, our approach is behavioral modification, right? How do we change people's behavior, right? And oftentimes, again, who, who is this narrative of who is a victim and who is not? The people that have suffered the greatest victimization, young men of color, 16 and 24, right? But yet that's never part of the discourse. So imagine if someone constantly negated your experiences but wanted you to be accountable for your actions. Do you think that helps? Do you think that helps someone who's experienced immense historical contemporary trauma to actually be a better citizen? So I think oftentimes we're going about this really wrong, right? I think so much of doing this work, right, is we have to be trauma informed, but we also have to validate folks' experiences. Most of the folks that are, you know, again, you know, within some violent construct themselves have experienced tremendous harm. We'll, we oftentimes say in the clinical community, hurt people hurt people. I was gonna, I was gonna let this one go, but I'm gonna jump in, because I thought it was a great question too, and I actually uh, think that your question uh, helps to tell the story of why it's so difficult to undo the system that we have. It's a binary system. It's one that, like any other business, has so many, it's processing so many things simultaneously, in this case, human beings, that we label things and we put them uh, uh, in a silo and we sort of send them on, a way, uh, on their way like a conveyor belt. Uh, I remember sitting on a panel next to Manhattan DA Cy Vance a couple of years ago and about 20 minutes into the discussion, he said, well, Glenn, you know, you've done a great job of talking about reentry and the importance of helping people coming home from prison, but you haven't said anything about the victims. And my visceral response was like, you know, D.A. Vance, with all due respect, I didn't learn how to, I didn't learn how to pull out a gun on someone until someone pulled out a gun on me. And I, I, I didn't have any moment to think about that. All, I, all that really came to mind for me was being a 13-year-old 
in, in, in New York and having a guy put a gun to my stomach and tell me to take off a piece of jewelry I had on and never once thinking I should call the police or call a prosecutor to deal with that. Like, you call the police when you think the person on the other side of that phone is going to do something to help you. And I grew up in a community with a narrative about people of color in this country not having any value and that the services that are available to most people to keep them safe are not available to people like me. And until we challenge that, I mean, we have a criminal justice system that is built on a, built on a set of values. And we have to ask, ask ourselves, what are those values? And for me, in my experience, all that's left is, is punishment um, uh, uh, and punitiveness. And there's no proportionality, no parsimony, no citizenship, no social justice. All those things are gone. And so every time we have a conversation about reform and we try to tinker with what we already have, what we're going to end up with is another version of what we have with the very same underlying values. And it's, it's why it's why I think the investment has to be made in human beings because, again, I think until people see commonality between the experience of people who've been in the system and themselves, we're just going to design a whole new version. Systems of oppression are durable and they reinvent themselves right under your nose. Think of the civil rights era, right? People who patted themselves on the shoulder because they had such huge success. I call them the four E's, education, employment, equality, and franchisement all things that have been eviscerated by our criminal justice system. With all due respect to our former president, who did a lot, who, 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 who worked on some of the issues I cared about, who brought college back to prison. I was invited to the White House to have a conversation uh, with senior advisors to the president and couldn't get in based on a 21-year-old conviction and had to end up writing a letter, an open letter to our president that got printed in the Wall Street Journal to get invited back to, to finally have a discussion with our president. But the discussion was, you know, what does it mean when a person like me who's done, I mean, I can bring you evidence of rehabilitation up to here and I can't get into the White House. What does that mean for the 70 million other Americans who are just out of prison who want to get a job at the local McDonald's? It's the right question. All right, so I think, should we wrap? Is it, I'm checking on our, okay. So I think we probably can, some of us can stay informally and answer some questions. I think some of our panelists have to go, but um, please join me in thanking all of the people who came here tonight and for you. <laughs>